Good morning, Cross Point Community Church family. It's good to see you here this morning. We're living in such uncertain times, but that's why we study the certainty of the sufficient scripture. So grab your Bibles, your coffee, your donuts, come with your family, and let's go study the Word of God together. Thank you for joining us again for study today. Uh, Here we are again doing worship via web, and I'm just going to start with a word of prayer. Would you join me as we approach God's throne of grace? God, you're so good to us. I want to thank you for all that you're doing in our lives to bring comfort through these uncertain times. Thank you for the comfort of the Holy Spirit of God within us. Thank you for the comfort of the sufficient word of God. Thank you for the comfort of relationships in the body of Christ. And so now, Father, I pray that you would bless us as we study your word. Please take this text and drive it deep into our hearts. Our prayer is that we would be doers of the word and not just hearers. So I pray today, Father, that you would bless us as we study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as as neat as this is, this worship via web thing, I find myself, as probably many of you do as well, longing for church relationships. Uh, I, I can't wait to return to seeing you in person again. I can't wait to smiling pa- faces of people. I can't wait to hugs and handshakes all around the church property. Hopefully soon. By the way, my daughter Eva is geared, ready to go for all of those hugs. I hope you're ready. Again, this whole preaching to empty chairs thing is still a bit awkward for me. Thanks for your patience with me, just like thousands of other preachers around the globe who overnight basically turned into televangelists, as many, many pointed out in social media this last week. Thank you for your patience with us. Honestly, uh, we wanted to make it real, uh, putting this platform here, this pulpit here, sorry, um, but I struggle with staying behind this pulpit. Uh, I struggle with not laughing together. Uh, I, I struggle with not in hear, hearing encouraging amens from people in the body of Christ. To me, preaching is so much of a two-way communication. It's a little harder to do to a camera to a bunch of empty seats. So please be patient with me as we work through this together. And all of this, I do want to say I am so thankful for modern technology that we can do this. I also want to say thank you Uh, 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 share gratitude for men like Matt and Mark who have made this possible. If you get a chance, please share gratitude with them. So here we are again this morning back in Philippians. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles, your devices, and actually go to Philippians chapter 4 this morning. Again, the handouts are printable online if you'd like to take those. and You can just follow along through the outline. Uh, Let's just take one brief minute for review this morning. Again, we're into the conclusion of this amazing letter, this amazing letter that has taught us so much about gospel-transformed living, living unity through humility, finding true joy in the Lord, standing firm in the Lord, Most recently in chapter 4, when we've been talking about standing firm in the Lord, we find, we found these amazing verses and this, um, these amazing discussion points. As we stand firm in the Lord, let us turn all of our anxieties into prayers, verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4. Wow, how, how appropriate is that? Verses 8 and 9 of chapter 4, as we stand firm in the Lord, embracing God's filter system for intended peace. Last week, finding the strength to be content in Christ. Contentment in Christ. All amazingly appropriate passages and discussions for where we're at in our culture right now. Today, this passage continues to be just as timely as we look at verses 10 through four, uh, sorry, verses 14 through 20. In times of need, we will fully participate in God's plan for care. Basically this, participating in sharing. So, what about this discussion on hoarding? 
definitely a hot topic at this point. Hoarding food, hoarding supplies during COVID-19. The fact is this, hoarding is our natural inclination, our, our, our proclivity in times of uncertainty. It's natural. Our natural default is to protect ourselves, and that isn't always bad. I mean, we just go to the scriptures and we think of Joseph in the Old Testament, preparing for needy times. This is natural to protect, protecting ourselves. However, the strong desire to protect can turn devious incredibly quickly in our lives. Our focus turns from eternal treasure to earthly treasure in a split second. Our selflessness turns into selfishness and greed, just like that. When we change quickly, we, become, we go from the Smeagol mentality to the Gollum mentality, just like that. Like children playing with Legos. You ever watch children play with Legos? <laughs> A quick change from fun and creativity to what? Don't you touch my pile. Like a bunch of starving teen boys at a party when there were only two pizzas bought and the last piece is on the table. Seriously, I'm going to kill you for that last piece. Like some moms during Black Friday mayhem, what do you see in Black Friday mayhem? A mom going from a caring mother bear buying Christmas gifts for her blessed children to a ferocious grizzly about to throw down on aisle four like some dads on the last day of the gun show, the ammo show, or some rare, uh, rare sale at Sportsman's Warehouse. What do you see? A dad who has this desire, this kind of, this neat thought of buying another gun and some ammo to, babe, we gotta sell the farm so I can buy another uh, 45 ACP. I need that. Very quickly, our desire to have turns into greed and selfishness. Like 3,000, or sorry, 300 million Americans right now. I mean, think about this. Going through COVID-19, when Charmin's ultra soft mega roll is finally restocked on the shelf at Costco. From calm, collected Jesus follower to who let the dogs out. From caring and sharing to, dude, why did you just purchase the entire pallet of teepee in one sitting at the Palisadro ho uh, holiday last Tuesday, March 24th, 2020? By the way, you know who you are. I may or, not, may or may not be struggling with bitterness at this point in the sermon. Sorry if you listened to this sermon this morning. Well, I'm kind of sorry. But, but anyways, you get the point. Very quickly, we go through this noble uh, feeling from God to protect ourselves and our families to this self-centered hoarding, this, this greed. And all of this, we need to remember that a very clear distinction in the scriptures of God's people who have been saved by God's amazing grace is that we refuse to allow hoarding to turn from greed, uh, from 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 sharing to greed and selfishness. We are called to care for those in need, to actually share our stockpile as big or as small as it might be, to share it with, with open hands. Just like the third century's Dionysius of Alexandria. Dionysius of Alexandria with the faithful Christians during the Cyprian plague, a plague that took 5,000 lives a day in Rome, willingly sharing of his resources and other believers' resources, risking their own lives to bring um, Jesus to the community. Just like the 16th century, Martin Luther of Wittenberg with his pregnant wife and faithful church members ministering through the reoccurring black death, willingly sharing of their resources and risking their lives to serve their community. 
Just like the 19th century young 20-year-old preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, as he ministered with those in his congregation during the cholera outbreak of 1854, willingly sharing of their resources and risking their lives to serve their community. Just like several other examples of church history shared by a guy named Glenn Scrivener uh, the last couple weeks. Just like the Church of Philippi in Macedonia through times of intense affliction and poverty. This is a church we've been studying. A church who five years prior to the writing of the book of Philippians, we find these words by Paul to the church of Corinth, explaining, describing the church of Philippi. I love 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, Maybe write down on your handout, 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 5. And I just want to describe what the church of Philippi was going through in this context. Paul says this to the church of Corinth about the church of Philippi. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. The churches of Macedonia are primarily Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Verse 2, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, Paul says, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. I mean, I read that and I think, wow, what an amazing reputation of the church of Philippi. This is a a reputation of the church that we're going to read about today, to study about today. The church of Philippi, who in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 20, we find more evidence of the heart of this church. I would like to start reading in verse 14, if you would follow along. Philippians chapter 4, verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, Paul says. Verse 15, and you Philippians yourself know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. And not that I seek a, a gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And here we go. This verse we've heard since we were little. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God, Be glory to our God and Father. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. What's happening here in this text? Simply enough, the church of Philippi, having gone through a severe test of affliction and extreme poverty, as we found in 2 Corinthians 8, had clearly refused the greedy temptation to hoard Rather, what was their response? Their response was to embrace the example of Jesus Christ and to share of their resources. To share with their resources in 2 Corinthians 8 with other believers and now particularly in this passage to share with the apostle Paul. So in this passage, Paul keys off on one Greek word, one Greek root words and he uses it twice. I mean, if if you look with me in verse 14, he uses the word share. He actually uses the word share, uh, translated share. In some of your translations, you'll also find the exact same English translation for share in verse 15. Uh, In this particular translation, the ESV, we find it as partnership. Listen to the verses. Yet I was, it was kind of you to share my trouble. Verse 15, and you Philippians know 
uh, yourselves know in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership. That's the same root word for share. This one Greek word means to partner in common interest, to share commonality, to be connected through sharing. Uh, The first use in verse 14 actually has a prefix to it that intensifies the idea of truly sharing. By the way, this is of, of interest. This was of interest to me that this is the exact same root as we find in the word fellowship in the New Testament. Koinonia, commonality. And Paul says, as a clear emphasis in this passage, share. He's keying off on this idea of sharing. In time of need, not neglecting the call of Jesus Christ in our lives to share. Now what about this sharing? In this text this morning, we briefly find some descriptions. It's not going to be an overly complicated outline, a very practical outline about sharing. Let's start in verse 14, and I want us to notice this description of sharing. First of all, sharing is a very practical expression of growth. I put there on your outline two words, of commendable growth. Growth meaning profit or increase. In other words, sharing is a very practical evidence that good growth, in other words, praiseworthy spiritual maturity is happening in the life of a believer. I think we can see the commendable aspect of this in verse 14. Look with me at verse 14. Paul says very clearly, it was kind of you to share in my trouble. Um, Another way to say it was kind of you, and, and actually that might be a bit misleading, the basic idea is this, you've done good. You did well. Uh, You deserve two thumbs up, church in Philippi. You have participated in something that's really, really, really good. Uh, Like a father just looking at his son after an accomplishment and just saying, you done good, son. You did well. Um, I think of my kids playing soccer after maybe a goal or or setting up a really good play at the end of the game. I'll, I'll, I'll gather them and I'll say, yo, that was beautiful. That was a good play. I mean, I think that's what verse 14 is saying here. It's like Paul saying to the church of of Philippi, yo, that was a good play. You done good. This is commendable. What you've done in sharing, two thumbs up, church. It's commendable. But then he ties it to this concept of, of growth. When we think of sharing, it's a very practical expression of, of growth in a life of a believer. Commendable growth, where do we find that? I think very clearly in verse 17. Paul says this, not that I seek a gift. We looked at that last week. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Simply, Paul is saying this, I seek growth in your spiritual life and it is seen specifically as you share of your resources. When we read this, our minds naturally go to, when we read the, root, the word fruit, we go to agricultural produce. Uh, for instance, my wife and I are trying to figure out how to, um, talking quite a bit about what and how and when to plant fruit trees on our property. How does that work in Northern California? Trying to figure that out. Well, that's naturally where our mind goes, but that's actually not the, the, the closest metaphor to this passage. This metaphor is actually one of of finance. In other words, this speaks of profit through a growing account. This speaks of accumulating interest in a positive account. Paul is saying this, I seek the positive interest that increases in your account. This is an outstanding metaphor to what's happening here. Very practically, in this text, Paul is saying to the church, my heart's desire is to see good growth in your life, to see you profit, to see you increase in your spiritual walk. And how is that going to happen? As you share. How is your growth very practically expressed as you share of your resources? What's the point? 
oftentimes spiritual growth is most observable in the life of a believer by how he handles his resources. Spiritual maturity in the life of a believer is seen by how loosely we hold on to the resources that God has blessed us with. All right. So Patrick Deedon's coffee is officially cold. So let's go to the second observation quickly. Not only sharing is a practical expression of good growth, but sharing of our resources, number two, is a practical expression of sacrificial worship. Catch this. Verse 18. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. And here it is. I absolutely love this description of sharing. It's a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Clearly, this sharing by the church of Philippi was referred to by Paul as an act of meaningful worship. I mean, we talk often of worship, and this is one of those very tangible expressions of worship to a great God. Just like in the Old Testament, I mean, if you think of uh, a couple passages, Exodus 29 or Leviticus 1, as the sacrifices were shared in the Old Testament, they were seen as being a, a good aroma to a holy God. Paul now keys off to this and he says, your sharing, oh, it's an act of worship and it is a good aroma to a holy God. This is entirely in line with how the New Testament speaks of our sacrifices, the sacrifices of New Covenant believers. Um, we could go right away to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, about the sacrifices of a New Covenant believer. But in my mind, I go to Hebrews 13, 16. Here's what it says. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are what? They're pleasing to God. The simple point of this passage for you and me, as we participate in sharing of our resources for the needs of other believers, this is a form of worship. And you know what this form of worship does? It makes God smile. Sharing of our resources makes God smile. All right, so observation number one. Sharing is a practical expression of growth. Observation number two. Sharing is a practical expression of worship. Observation number three. I'm going to move rather quickly through this one because Les Converse has already gone through three cups of coffee. So here it is. Observation number three. Sharing is a practical expression of big God theology. <laughs> What am I talking about? Would you look with me at verses 19 and 20? And my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches, to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now right into verse 20. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Why is this considered big God theology? Clearly this, because it truly recognizes and trusts in the sovereign hand of a mighty God. Paul is promoting God's sovereign ownership, God's unmatched riches, and God's eternal splendor. And it's all connected to this concept of sharing. Notice very plainly that this passage says that God will supply every need of yours. This need is referring to what God knows to be necessary of your existence. Not simply every misguided desire. And we know the book of James clearly debunks that. Praying according to our own lusts, our own desires. But this is what we need to survive, what a sovereign God knows that we need to survive in this life. When we think about God providing for our needs, I mean, we have to think about John 3.16. 
This is the same concept of what God did in our lives spiritually. When we were in need, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This God who provided for our spiritual need is the same God who is interested in our physical needs. He's the same God that is interested in taking care of the things we need, the necessities of our life right now to keep us going all the way into eternity future. It may not be millions, but it will certainly be sufficient. When we think of sharing and we think of big God theology, we remind ourselves that a sovereign God is a God who is concerned about taking care of of our needs. God will supply these needs in accordance to his unmatched riches and his eternal glory. The basic idea here is this. As we see and experience a really big God, we are going to find that our grip on our things loosens up substantially because just like the lilies of the field in Matthew 6, Just like the birds of the air in Matthew chapter 6, God the Father is in the business of providing just what his loved children need to help them survive in our temporary home. To help us survive in our temporary home as we look forward to the riches of our eternal home. Very simply this, as we share of our resources, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are proving that we trust in a big God. (laughs) Let's take a minute and just review these, these observations in this text. A text very clearly talking about sharing. As we share of our resources, it is a very practical expression, number one, of good growth. It is a very practical expression of sacrificial worship. And number three, it is a very practical expression of big God theology. As we share of our resources, it truly proves our view of a big God. So what? Well, we need to ask ourselves some questions before we even get to that. So what though? I want us to kind of reduce this down to a key idea. The heart of this passage would be something like this. We must faithfully participate in sharing of our resources. This is a very clear indication of this text. We must faithfully participate in sharing of our resources. In time of need, we must faithfully participate with open hands. Connecting the distinguishing points Uh, maybe an extended form of the key idea would be this, and I think it's on your handout, this. As we grow in Christ, we must faithfully participate in sharing of our resources because a God who is worthy of worship is also a glorious God who can fill the order. This God who is worthy of worship is a glorious God who will fill the demand. So what? Through this time of uncertainty, and I want to make this very clear, to many of us around us, there's a lot of uncertainty going on. Through COVID-19, what's tomorrow going to look like? What's the next day going to look like? What does the death toll look like? Or is this all just a hyped up situation? What is this going to look like? What's the economic structure going to look like in our world? What is the stimulus package going to look like? There's so many uncertainties in the world we live in right now. But then that's why we run to a big God who can supply our needs. And that's where we run to a passage like this. And the so what would come in a question similar to this. So am I selflessly sharing right now? Yes, we are talking about finances. Uh, In very practical ways, what am I doing to share of my finances? But also, in a sub-theme way, we are also practically talking about our time, our talents, our energies. I want to say this. 
I am so thankful for the body of Christ at Cross Point Community Church. This week with, with uh, eyes filled with tears on a couple different occasions, I was thanking God for the body of Christ at Cross Point Community Church. Thinking about godly builders and godly mechanics and godly electricians and godly engineers, godly businesswomen and businesswomen, godly salesmen, godly techies, godly attorneys, godly healthcare professionals, godly investors, godly realtors, godly drivers, godly nannies, godly secretaries, godly school administrators and teachers, godly students, godly firemen, godly protectors of the peace, godly food providers, godly cleaners, godly stay-at-home moms, godly retirees, all who look for tangible ways to share of their resources. And I want to say this week, overwhelmed with this thought of just simply praise God for a sharing body of believers at Cross Point Community Church. And so here the exhortation would be this, don't stop. Through times of uncertainty, don't stop. Even if that financial sharing is online or in the mail so that Cross Point Community Church can continue to see God's work carry on. Amen, Chuck Mellon. I think I heard him say amen from the third floor. And yes, now I have officially become a televangelist. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we conclude our time together and study as we think about these uncertain times that we live in, as we hold to the certainty and sufficiency of Scripture from this passage this morning, we remind ourselves that we must faithfully participate in sharing of our resources because a God who is worthy of worship is also a glorious God who can fill the order. Hey, thanks for joining us for worship this morning. Just a couple quick reminders. Uh, some of those devotional videos will be posted from the Cross Point elders this week. Take a look at them. Also this, don't stop cultivating relationships in the body of Christ. Two phone calls, five texts a day. That's the challenge. Take time to develop and cultivate relationships in the body of Christ. Lastly this, please know you are loved. Have a blessed week in Christ.